A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in human beings, who seeks his strength in flesh, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a barren bush in the desert that enjoys no change of season, but stands in a lava waste, a salt and empty earth. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord. He is like a tree planted beside the waters that stretches out its roots to the stream. It fears not the heat when it comes, its leaves stay green. In the year of drought it shows no distress, but still bears fruit. More torturous than all else is the human heart, beyond remedy. Who can understand it? I, the Lord alone, probe the mind and test the heart to reward everyone according to his ways, according to the merit of his deeds. The word of the Lord. Blessed are they who hope in the Lord. Bless the man who follows not the counsel of the wicked, nor walks in the way of sinners, nor sits in the company of the insolent, but delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night. He is like a tree planted near running water that yields its fruit in due season and whose leaves never fade. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked, not so. They are like chaff which the wind drives away. For the Lord watches over the way of the just, but the way of the wicked vanishes. Dominus Fobiscum. Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam. Jesus said to the Pharisees, There was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and fine linen and dined sumptuously each day. And lying at his door was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, he was carried away by angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. And from the netherworld where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am suffering torment in these flames. Abraham replied, My child, remember that you received what was good during your lifetime, while Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, whereas you are tormented. Moreover, between us and you a great chasm has established, is established to prevent anyone from crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours or from your side to ours. He said, then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they too come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, 
They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, oh no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then Abraham said, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. Verbum Domini. So we are in the season of Lent. And as we've talked about a lot during this season, it's a penitential season. It's a time of you know, imitating, drawing into Jesus' temptation in the desert, which is an anticipation of his victory on Calvary, where he defeats Satan in the temptation of the desert, definitively crushes the head of the serpent on Calvary, and then through his resurrection gives us new life. And we could say, you know, the whole liturgical seasons of the church is an unfolding in the mystery of Christ, you know, throughout the year. His birth and his suffering, death, and resurrection. Easter certainly is the high point of our redemption, that celebration of God's blessings and great works that he's done for us in his son, Jesus Christ. So in the liturgy and the sacraments of the church and the liturgical seasons, Christ is communicating and dispensing the grace of his paschal mystery through the Holy Spirit, that we can, through faith, enter into the mysteries of our salvation and receive grace you know, appropriate to that season, marked by that season. And Lent is a time of penance and conversion and this outpouring of this grace of the Holy Spirit seeks, the Catechism teaches, seeks to awaken faith, conversion of heart, and adherence to the Father's will. To increase our faith that we may be converted and to cling to the Father's will, to seek his will. We're blessed by God in our creation and redemption, and our response is to be one of adoration, praise, and thanksgiving. You know, there's this dual aspect, these gifts and blessings in our response of prayer, conversion, adoration, thanksgiving. And in Lent, we express that conversion and foster it by prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And today in the gospel, we have a most solemn command to care for the poor. Our eternal destiny you know, is dependent on that. How do we treat the least among us? The first reading today, I think, speaks eloquently in the responsorial psalm of this turning back to the Lord, this conversion to God. The first reading, Jeremiah 17, is kind of a reformulation of the responsorial psalm, which is Psalm 1, the first psalm about prayer and clinging and dependence on God. Jeremiah is prophesying uh, before and during the Babylonian exile, the, the exile from, I mean, just at the very start of it, there was three waves of this exile in 605 BC, 597, which was the largest. And they took kind of the upper strata of the society in 605 and 9, the 597 is the biggest wave of taking people into Babylon. And in 587, finally, the destruction of the temple and the carrying off of the, the king. And they would return in 538. But they would return without a, a true king. They would have lost the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, but they would come back and rebuild the temple. So this was absolutely devastating event, but also an image of our restoration and salvation brought about by Christ, you know, who fulfills that kingship and that the ark in the sense of being the fullness of this place of worship and communion with God. So Jeremiah is prophesying before this event and during these waves of exile, 
And, you know, at the heart of his message is to return to the covenant. You know, they had previously under the King Josiah, they had found the scroll of the law, and he was trying to lead a reform. He was eventually killed in battle. So Jeremiah is trying to, you know, increase this return to the Lord, return to the covenant, return to God. And that's at the heart of conversion, returning to God, depending on him, living by his law, seeking his will, as I read of this gifts of the Holy Spirit, that God's calling us back to him through the Holy Spirit. So it applies to every age, to trust in God, and certainly in our age, maybe more than ever, that we trust in ourselves or in you know, the world and the ways of doing things and human strength. And Jeremiah gives this most beautiful image. It's kind of like his version of Psalm 1 about this barren bush in the desert. You know, we can, if we trust in God, who's the stream flowing through the desert, God's presence, his Holy Spirit, the source, you know, the, the grace in our life, we can be like a, a tree in the desert planted by these stream, these waters. And then we can stretch out our roots to the stream. And when the heat comes, he says, the leaves will stay green and drought shows no distress but bears fruit. Even though all around in the desert there's all this uh, life isn't flourishing, the Christian, the believer, can draw close to the stream of God's grace and Holy Spirit. The barren bush, on the other hand, enjoys no change of season, stands in a lava waste, a salt and empty earth. The barren bush, he says, trusts in human beings, seeks his strength and the flesh whose heart turns away from the Lord. A tree besides these flowing waters, the stream, we have God's presence in our life. His love, his grace strengthens and transforms us. So the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord, is like this flourishing bush. It's a beautiful image. You know, I've told this story before, but I know visiting our sisters out in in the Phoenix area, you take a walk, maybe on some trail in a park out there, and it's this desert, and you see all these different kinds of cactus and everything, and they're all fighting to get water and to hold on to that water, right? Water, if you don't have water, you're gonna eventually die, and you see it with the aggressiveness of all these cactus and stuff, they have stickers, and you get near them, they're telling you very clearly, get away from me, don't take my water. And even here, you'd go canoeing or something in the rivers. You just see all these trees on the shore, and they have all these roots that just come down to the water, right, and, and suck up that water. It's a powerful image that if we want to thrive, we need that stream of God's grace. We need his Holy Spirit. And cursed is the man who trusts in human beings, who seeks his strength in the flesh, whose heart turns away from the Lord. The heart, the catechism teaches, is the hidden center. It's beyond the grasp of reason. You know, Jeremiah describes it as tortuous. You know, that more tortuous than all else is the human heart beyond remedy. Who can understand it? The only remedy is God's grace, his Holy Spirit. Only in the Spirit of God can we fathom the human heart and know it fully, even ourselves. You know, we can't even fully understand and comprehend ourselves and why we do things sometimes. It is the place of decision, the place of encounter, the place of relationship and depending on God. The Catechism too, as well, in speaking about a life of virtue, it has this powerful couple sentences I want to read. It says, Man's dignity therefore requires him to act out of conscious and free choice, as moved and drawn in a personal way from within, and not by blind impulses in himself or by mere external constraint. Man gains such dignity when ridding himself of all slavery to the passions, he presses forward to his goal by freely choosing what is good, 
and by his diligence and skill effectively secures for himself the means suited to the end. So it, so it talks about this enslavement of our passions that if we give in to the flesh and our fallen human desires, our tendency to sin, we got the flesh pulling us one way, but if we follow the spirit and free ourselves from these enslavement of passions, you know, through God's grace, we choose what's good. And by diligent skill, effectively secures for himself the means suited to the end. That that choosing the good is made possible by God's grace, by his liberation, by dependence on him. And I like that because it, it speaks of the, the cooperation of our free will and God's grace. And even our free will is moved by God's grace and our freedom is maintained. That's the mystery of it all. But that's how we know our fulfillment. You know, by God directs us to himself from within. He's not forcing us. Love is freely given. So from within, he's calling us to himself that we must choose what to do good. And when we do that, when we choose the good, make decisions in our life, what do we want our life to be about? We know a, a new freedom. Our freedom actually grows. We're living in the true dignity of which we're called. Otherwise, giving into sinful inclinations and you know these passions that could pull us one way or the other, our passions are to be ruled by reason, guided by reason, you know, enlightened by God's grace. That's how we can be this this thriving bush, even in a desert, even where there is no water. But I like that thing about making decisions. What are we gonna do with our life? What are we gonna do today? Are we gonna choose God? Are we gonna choose his path? Are we gonna choose evil? So when we choose God, the Holy Spirit guides us. We can adhere to the Father's will versus seeking strength in the flesh, which leads us to fear, despair, and failure. And hopefully we hit a point where we say enough is enough, right? <laughs> I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I wanna trust God. I wanna rely on his strength. I was recently reading in a spiritual book about, they use this beautiful phrase of just trusting in God's loving mercy trusting in God's loving mercy. You know, we can be overcome by fear if we're trusting in ourselves and the flesh or human respect or trying to just acquire the things of this world. But if we trust in God's mercy, turning ourselves over that, seeking to do his will, we can have his strength and guidance in life and we can be liberated from paralyzing fear. Trusting in God's loving mercy. That's that's the good news, that by following God, seeking his will, we're entrusting ourselves to his love and to his mercy. It's all good. And there's difficulties in life, there's the cross, but trusting ourselves to him, we can know a human flourishing, a, a prospering that the world cannot give and the flesh cannot give.